So this is our learning objectives. We'll be looking at the meaning and nature of ethics, branches of ethics, ethics and related terms, sources of ethics, Kohlberg and Gilligan's theory, theories of moral development, ethical reasoning, absolutism and relativism, um, relativism, four cardinal principles of ethics, cognitivism, and non-cognitivism, objectives of ethics, and the nature of ethics. And as I indicated earlier, the nature of ethics will even be uh, clear from the very first slide where we want to look at the meaning and the nature of ethics. So by the time we finish with all these learning objectives, we should have understood the nature of ethics. Okay. So separating science from philosophy is the logical first step in grasping the concept of ethics, simply because ethics is an integral component of philosophy. So what we want to say is that in order for us to appreciate the concept of ethics, we should be able to separate science from philosophy, okay? Because ethics itself is part of philosophy. So we have to know what science is, and what philosophy is before we can really understand the issues surrounding ethics. So philosophy is the study of human belief system. All right, so when we're dealing with philosophy, we're dealing with human belief system. Our belief as to what is right, what is wrong, falls under the notion or the concept of philosophy. And that is where ethics also is, all right? Philosophy seeks to address the why type of questions, while science deals with the how type of questions. So whenever you hear the word philosophy, it normally deals with very, very difficult questions. Okay, like why, how basically is the methods or the procedures as to how something should be done. And it's normally easy or it's quite yeah, logical to be able to understand how to get something done than to answer the question, why? Okay, why do people behave the way they behave? Why do, some, why would somebody kill? Why do people steal? And those type of questions are very, very difficult. Okay, but if once you get to know the why, then it helps in the how. The how of doing things, methodological way of addressing issues fall under science. And it's a bit easy to deal with than actually answering the why type of questions. Because most times, nobody actually knows why certain things happen, okay? So that is the aspect. But that is the realm where ethics fall under. Why people behave the way they behave. In fact, if you ask anybody, they will have some form of justification for the, their type of behavior or their type of attitude. And therefore it becomes very difficult to, to be able to judge or tell them whether they are right or wrong and so on and so forth, all right? So the dimension that deals with why type of issues falls under what is known as philosophy. And when we're dealing with the how type of questions, we're trying to address uh, the science aspects of issues. Okay, so the topic of what is right or wrong in human behavior is addressed by the philosophical subfield known as ethics. So if we want to find out whether some particular human behavior is right or wrong, then we're dealing with the area of philosophy known as ethics. Okay, so philosophy encompasses the knowledge found in these disciplines. Because normally the why type of questions are difficult to address, you need to find various ways to be able to, to, to answer them, all right? One question that most philosophers have been dealing with for ages is probably to address the question of the existence of God, okay? It's, once you're a human being, largely it's, it's based on belief, your belief system. And so how do we kind of explain that? How do we get a science aspect of trying to be able to explain to somebody, say, God exists? Because it's, it's just a belief system. 
is is falls within the realm of the why type of questions, which are very, very difficult. Okay, so philosophy tries to use these other disciplines to try and address the why type of questions. Okay, so they have a discipline known as logic, and that is the study of reasoning, analysis, and argumentation. All right, so if we go back to our question of uh, whether God exists or not, uh, why do we have to believe in God? For example, if I was to open it up, most of you may have either testimonies of yourself or of other people that you can use as a basis to believe that God exists. Others may use um, arguments, okay? Some may use say, nature, the way things are done and come to the conclusion. There is morning and there is afternoon, there is evening. What again, there is raining season, there is dry season, and therefore these things cannot be done just randomly. There should have been a creator or somebody that is regulating how all of this is done. Okay, you've not seen that, that God, but you basically want to use some reasoning, you want to use some analysis, you want to use some argumentations to be able to accept your belief or your faith that God actually exists. Okay, so logic is a discipline under philosophy because most of the time we have to use logic to be able to make decisions and accept certain things even when we, we, we have not seen the actual uh, reality of those particular issues, all right? So if somebody comes to you or always sees you and frown or something, the conclusion will be that the person doesn't like you or if the person gets the opportunity, he or she may hurt you. That might not be the case. It might just be that by coincidence, whenever you meet the person, the person is hungry or someone else have offended the person and that's why the person is ang angry at that point in time. All right, but you use logic to conclude and make decisions and that falls within the realms of philosophy. All right, then another discipline under philosophy is what is known as aesthetics. So the study of ideal form and behavior. Aesthetic, aesthetics normally deals with beauty, right? How nice a shape or a form is, is, is part of um, philosophy. Okay, so sometimes the way to address the why type of questions, once again, about the existence of God is to look at nature. Some people look at nature. Uh, if you go to mountains and see the mountains, if you look at some trees, if you look at the clouds and so on and so forth, people look at just the beauty of nature and conclude that this world and the way it is framed and shaped could not have come as a result of an accident and that there should have been somebody that, that created that. So the study of ideal form and behavior is, is an, a dimension and an aspect of ethics. And within our context of ethics, normally human beings must come to accept that certain type of behavior should be ideal, all right? It's the right one. If we don't have that, for example, who, who taught man that stealing was bad? All right. But maybe with time, you realize that uh, it is not proper for you to take something that belongs to somebody after the person has struggled so much to be able to acquire that. All right. So because we want some beauty, some niceness, some form in, uh, in society, we actually want to bring certain norms and standards in place to maintain that order and beauty in society. So aesthetics is also an aspect of philosophy, and that helps in also trying to explain uh, the concept of ethics, all right? Another discipline is politics. So the ideal form of government and social institutions and organizations as part. So later we'll see that ethical behavior and our belief systems and our norms, we have them from certain institutions. So the form of government here is not really about political parties. We're talking about structures like the family, like the church, like uh, educational institutions. They have a way of influencing our belief systems, 
okay? So philosophy also has uh, some dimension that has to do with politics. The school you attend to, the church that you attend, uh, the family you are raised from, the friends you work with, have a way of influencing your belief system and, and how you see certain things in society. Okay, so aspects, politics is a part of the dimension of, uh, of philosophy. Then finally, we have what is known as metaphysics. All right. So it's a sophisticated examination of substance, motion, space, and time. So here is another complex way to be able to understand how things are. Well, I was talking about the creation of the world, the existence of God, and so on and so forth. Okay. So in time past, we were told the earth is flat. Now we are told it's sphere, sphere, uh, spherical or something of that sort. It's a sphere, right? Uh, and so on. So the study of some complex things, okay? How wide the earth is, uh, the length of the moon from whatever. It gets to a point where scientists must use some form of estimations, okay, to be able to tell some of these things. If they were to tell you the size of the earth, sometimes the question is, is it that they use an airplane to be able to run through all the earth to take the measurement? Or the distance of the earth to the moon and things like that, okay? There is an, a study, there is a thinking, there is some analysis that goes beyond science when it comes to this type of studies. So metaphysics to be able to understand space, time, motion, substance, their compositions and all that goes beyond uh, science and sometimes goes into the dimension of philosophy, all right? So logic, aesthetics, politics, metaphysics, all of these fall under philosophy. And then we said ethics also is a dimension of uh, philosophy. So as we study ethics, We'll be using a lot of these other disciplines to be able to understand why certain behavior can be considered to be right and others can be deemed to be wrong. Okay. So the definition of ethics. So the word ethics is derived from the word, Greek word ethicos, which means behavior, conduct, or habit. All right. So it's basically behavior, conduct, or habit. So ethics is often referred to as, as the science of morality. So don't forget we said the science aspect of everything is how, all right? The philosophy aspect is the why. So now we want to understand why people behave in a certain way. So we need to study that, try and put some analysis into that. And that is where the science comes in. So the science of morality, the, the attempt to study the issue of morality is what is known as ethics, okay? There are several explanations of it. So the next one says, ethics is the study of what is right or good be human behavior. Ethics is the science of ideal involved in human life. So if you remember the disciplines and the philosophy we spoke about, uh, aesthetics, the study of beauty, ideal form, and so on and so forth. So if you want to study the science of ideal involved in human life, what should be the normal way of behaving as far as human beings are concerned? That falls under ethics, okay? Then the science of moral judgment, for us to be able to know whether something is wrong or good, bad, and so on and so forth, falls under ethics. The science of morals in human conduct, the study of the general nature of morals and of specific moral choices. So anything that has to do with whether something is right or wrong and we want to know that, then we are in the realm of ethics, trying to understand whether something is right or wrong. So there are five branches or divisions of ethics. The first one is known as the applied ethics. So the use of ethics in real world situations. So example, we have what is known as bioethics. So when it comes to medicine, um, have you heard about messy killing? Uh, they, they have a term for it, where if somebody is actually suffering a lot, 
with the consent of the family or relatives, they, they can give the doctor the permission to actually inject or kill the person literally, all right? Maybe it's on life support, it's on medication, it's so expensive, the family can no longer afford, and, and so they give the permission. Most of the time, it's like it's life support, right? You, they just lose soap because it's per day or something like that. And so they go into some form of agreement for, for, for the person to die, for that life support system to cease, and, and that will lead to the death of the person. Yeah, so the question is, is it ethical? Is it right to do that? If you were the family, how would you see it? Because to them, they are spending a lot of money and it's probably the case that the person might not, <laughs> might not survive or even when he comes back to life, he may not contribute anything meaningful again to life. Okay? So from their persp perspective, they may see that way. But if you were the person also lying down seeking <laughs> to survive uh, under the life support, Will you see that decision to be ethical? So we have ethics in, in medicine, in biology. Uh, recently, there was all manner of argument about this, um, this artificial way of bringing uh, food. How do you call it? You, you apply some or you connect to breeds of animals or plants and they are able to produce more than what is required. It just, it just you said? Genetic, genetics. No, there is just something, but not genetics. Oh, okay. Just something, right? So it, it, it calls for, it helps to bring a lot of uh, food, artificial way of just growing food, okay? But other scientists have raised the issue of it leading to cancer and so on and so forth because they are not natural foods, okay? Oh, nobody remembers that. It's, 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 it has become popular, but I, I just forgot about that. So in biology, in real everyday stuff, as far as scientists are concerned, they, they, they come across issues of ethics every day, okay? Then business ethics as well. These are real stuff. When it comes to the quality of, of products that you have to give to your customers, will you invest more knowing that it may eat into the profits of the company? When it comes to pricing, will you price your product at reasonable prices or just because you want to make uh, profit, you price them unreasonably? When it comes to advertisement, Okay, are you prepared to do deceptive advertisement just because you want to make more money? So when we use ethics in real life situations or real world situations, that is what is meant by applied ethics, all right? Environmental ethics, we've seen that a lot in Ghana when it comes to the mining sector. Is it just about money or are you thinking about sustainability as far as the environment is concerned? Okay, Regina, I can see you on. The technique, I don't know whether it's grafting technique or something. Yes, I'm yes, but sure. there is, yes, grafting, but they have, um, it's just in my mouth, but they have, is it geo something, geo fruits or something? There's some term for it. So by oh. grafting, where you do something to get more yields and so on. Yeah. Or, Sometimes it's not, it's not even about grafting. It's about artificial, where okay. you know now people can grow fruits even in, in their whatever, uh, sitting rooms or oh, wow. some environment, all right? That, that is not really natural. And, and others have kicked against it because uh, it could have health, health implications and so on and so forth. I, when I remember, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Okay, okay, so okay. that is the, the yeah. So, the second one, please. Uh, Kumasi sector. The yes. rest just let me know that the whole class was not able to join the class, so I don't know. That is not an issue. If they were not, I said I will record it so later they can listen to it. 
Okay, okay. So that is for applied ethics, normative ethics, establish moral benchmarks that define what appropriate and inappropriate behavior is. So, and I applied ethics, we're dealing with real world situations. And I gave you examples on the bioethics and business ethics. Okay. With normative ethics, it is where society wants to establish moral benchmarks that will help people to know what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable, all right? So uh, the example is the golden rule. Do unto others as you want others to do unto you or something of that sort, all right? So that becomes like a standard for everybody that will guide your behavior to be able to determine whether a particular behavior is appropriate or not. If you will not like something done to you, then the logic is that you shouldn't be doing that onto other people, all right? So that is the norm that society will set for everybody. But we have another type of ethics known as descriptive ethics. So what the public actually believes to be right or wrong, the norm is what generally will put in place. This is what we expect that as a normal be human being you should behave. But in reality, what people normally, the behavior of people is normally defined by what is known as the descriptive ethics, okay? What the public actually believes to be right or wrong. And here is subject, the public here is subject to the context, the country, the environment within which you find yourself, all right? So if we go to the normative ethics for, and want to use the Bible, say, as the yastic, the standard will be that um, a female should marry a male or a male should marry a female, right? There shouldn't be same-sex marriage. That then becomes the standard. You say that by nature or the faith or Bible, that is the normative ethics that is expected. But if you come to the descriptive ethics, then it becomes what a particular society or community actually believe to be right or wrong. So that brings us to the example of same-sex marriage again. Whereas Bible or the normative might be, standard might be that every man should marry a woman, in reality, the descriptive ethics will be left to the public to decide. Okay, so if you go to some countries or some communities, same-sex sex marriage is legal. If you go to other places, it's an abomination, all right? And therefore, it, they, it's not based on normative. It's based on what they describe to be their type of ethics, what they accept to be, to be their right or wrong. Okay. Then we have meta-ethics. It aims to understand the nature of ethical considerations, assertions, attitudes, and judgments. So meta-ethics wants to assess what we consider to be ethical or not ethical, okay? So it is not, it's an assessment. When you examine what you have indicated that this is your ethical behavior, it must be scrutinized to find out whether indeed it is indeed right to consider whatever you are telling us to be ethical or not. For example, the golden rule is that do unto others as you want others to do unto you. Okay, on the surface, it looks, it looks nice because the assumption is that what you want done to you will always be something that is nice or good. But we have people that, that love pain, that love harm, all right? And so the question is, if that person is a person that enjoys, say, beating, all right? It, it may sound weird. Okay, but it is true. Some, some people want to be beaten and all manner of stuff. Does it mean if they beat other people <laughs> that do not like it? Is that, is that ethical? Uh, okay. So the very things that we consider generally to be right or wrong, when we now go into analyzing or critiquing, assessing them, then we fall under what is known as meta-ethics. I right. want to understand whether those things are even right or wrong in the first place. Are we okay with that? 
Đây là Clay. Yes, sir. Okay. Then we have modern ethics concentrates on deontological and consequential aspects of moral development in human behavior. So we'll come into this much later in details. I think lecture three is about the theories of ethics. Okay, so with modern ethics, the issue is whether doing right or good should be a matter of duty or you should be doing that based on consequences or reward that you get. What I mean by that is that now there's two blocks, two major blocks, even though there's a third one. As far as ethical uh, behavior is concerned, some see it as a duty. What it means is that it's not really based on what you will get from it or the punishment that may come to you if you don't do it. It is just a requirement that you should behave in a certain way. Some may say from religious perspective or say from natural law uh, perspective, it is just expected that you should behave in a certain way. Other scholars have the view that people should be able to make their ethical decisions or take behave ethically by looking at the consequences of their unethical behavior, all right? So I'm not really be, being ethical because I want to, but if I choose to be unethical, there are consequences that I will not like to bear, and therefore I'm forced to be ethical. So that's the consequential aspects. All right. So we'll be looking at these things in detail. So the modern ethics is torn between the ontological aspects and consequential aspects of moral development and human behavior. Okay. So let me go over branches of ethics. We have applied ethics, the use of ethics in real world situations, normative ethics. It establish moral benchmarks that define what appropriate and inappropriate behavior is. And most of the time we get them from religious books for those people that are people of faith. Then we have descriptive ethics. That is why the public or society actually consider to be right or wrong, in spite of whatever the normative ethics will have said. Then meta ethics is when we want to assess, critique, understand the nature of the what we consider to be ethical characteristics, assertions, attitudes, and judgment. And finally, in modern ethics, we want to understand or concentrate on the deontological and consequential aspects of moral development and human behavior. Okay. So we move to ethics and related terms. So there are some terms that are related to ethics, but they may not be the same as ethics. Others are almost like ethics, okay? So let's look at the first one, ethics and morality. So much earlier, we said that this is the study of uh, right and wrong, human behavior as to whether something is good or bad. So let's look at that. It's almost like morality, all right? So morality refers to the rules and guidelines which an individual or a group has about what is right or wrong, good or evil, and this same as ethical principles, uh, same as ethical principles give idea about what is right or wrong, true or false. All right. So in essence, if you use the word morality, it's almost like using ethics. So ethics and morality may be assumed to mean the same because they all provide guidelines or rules as to what is right or wrong, what is good or bad, okay? Then let's look at ethics and religion. Why? Because religion generally also seeks to talk about what is right and want to encourage its uh, adherents or followers to do that which is right. So are they the same? If you use ethics and then religion, are we talking about the same thing? Okay. So religion derives its precepts not only from human experience, but from divine revelation. So unlike ethics where 
the norms, the rules will generally be coming from human experiences. People interact among themselves and decide that, no, at this point, we need to set these rules so that society will be normal and, and things will be uh, in order. When it comes to religion, it goes beyond human experience. And most of the religious precepts, please, if you are not, can you mute your mind? I'm getting feedback. Okay. So religion, the precepts do not just come from human experience, but they also come from divine revelation. All right. Whilst ethics is basically based on human beings trying to set some rules to guide their behavior. When it gets to religion, we have divinity or divine revelations as part of that. So the God aspects or divine a supernatural aspects is what separates religion from ethics. Okay. The similarity, however, is that ethics gets ideas from religion and thorough experiments and thoroughly experiments it approves them as code of what conduct. So the ethics, which are guidelines that human beings will normally set for themselves, most of the time, the, the source of some of these guidelines and, and standards normally will be coming from religion. Okay. So there are human beings that feel that no, these religious ideas will make sense if we were to adopt them into society. So they normally have their roots from religious texts and books. So that is that for ethics and religion. The main difference is that religion is not just based on human experience, but it has some divine revelations or connections to it, whilst ethics normally are based on people coming together to set their own norms and guidelines to guide their behavior, okay? The similarity is that most religious, uh, whatever, ethical standards and norms are driven from religion, okay? That's the connection. Then let's look at ethics and law. So law basically differs from ethics in its option to use force when necessary. And in fact, it is backed by power. So when you're dealing with law, law is a, has a, the backing of power or coercion, all right? If you don't do it, you, go, you don't go scot-free. There are punishments, especially when it gets to criminal law. There are always defined punishment associated with every crime. Okay, so that is the issue about law, and there is power backing that. If you were to commit a crime, you have a case with the state. But if it is even against a human being, once it's a criminal act, it is the state or the attorney general that is supposed to prosecute and handle the case. So there is some force, some, some power that compels people to obey the law. That is not the case of ethics. Ethics generally is based on admonishment for people to do what is right and, and so on and so forth. Okay, that is not backed by any force or by any power. But when it deals, when it comes to law, if you don't do that, uh, generally there is some force or some power that that will compel you to obey the law. Okay, right. Ethics concentrates on do's and the law on the don'ts. So ethics is more of encouraging you to do that which is right, and the emphasis of the law. It's about preventing you from doing that which is wrong. So law is on don'ts and ethics normally concentrates on do's. Okay. But ethics is a much wider term than law. All right. So, yes. So ethics is about encouraging you to do that which is right, that which is good. And most of the time, what is good may not be legal. Okay, in fact, sometimes even what's legal may be wrong within some context. But if you are ethical, you must go beyond the law and do that which is right. All right. I think yesterday also I was teaching my class and 
we're talking about something related to this. And I was talking about the minimum wage, right? Yeah, being ethical means going beyond the law. The minimum wage, why is the current minimum wage? I think they gave me the figure 15 or something like that. When we multiplied it by 30, we had 445 or something of that nature. And in class, we also did some estimates of how much they spend per day and, and multiply that by 30. And the figure was almost over 1,000 uh, there about. All right. And I was trying to explain to them that if if you some an employer paid somebody, say, 450 or even 500, in the eyes of the law, that employer has operated legally. Okay. But in the eye of ethics, the employer has not done which is right. Okay. Because, because given the real general living condition and the cost of living, that amount of money that the law says, uh, an the minimum amount that an employer should pay his or a worker and will be deemed to have been following the law falls short of ethical standards. Okay. So ethics is much wider term than the law because sometimes what is good, what is proper, far exceeds the requirements of the law. So that's the difference between ethics and law as well. Okay. Then let's look at ethics and values. So we have to also look at this because values also have to do with that having some traits or attributes that can be cherished and they tend to be good ones. Okay, so very, very close to the concept of ethics. So moral values are deep-seated ideas and feelings that manifest themselves as behavior or conduct. All right, so they are deep-seated ideas and feelings that help or show themselves in a way that you behave. Values can be converted into rules of behavior that can be derived as ethics. So the values that people have and people hold esteem can be the basis for drafting ethical standards or behavior, okay? I'm still getting feedback. Please mute your mic if you are not talking. I'm getting so much feedback. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so with values, ethics and values, what we're basically seeing is that the connection is that most of the ethical standards or guidelines that we have are largely based on values that people hold dear to themselves. Later, we'll look at the values in details, okay? Like justice, hard work, uh, compassion and care. All of these values tend to help when we set in ethical standards or guidelines for ourselves. Okay. So who sets sources of ethics? Who sets moral standards? All right, somewhere when we're talking about types of ethics, if you remember, we spoke about what is known as the um, normative ethics coming from the word, the roots were normal, right? What we can consider to be the standard. And I said, most of the time, they may be coming from religious text, Bible, Quran, and that helps us to know the normal standard and so on and so forth. But we also have descriptive ethics that will be based on society or the public deciding on what they consider to be their good or bad, all right? So we have to know who sets moral standards. So some of the agents or institutions that set moral norms that are used in ethics for the purpose of making judgments are one, we have tradition and convention and intergenerational practices, okay? So here, <laughs> I don't know your community or where you grew up from, but normally there are some belief systems that are like, from you, you don't have to know why, you just have to obey, all right? It is just something in the community and from year to year, I'm sure you've also spoken to your children about that. So from intergeneration, 
those practices have existed and people have considered this to be the way of life, the good way of behaving in a particular society or community. Here, I want your feedback. Any examples of tradition and conventions and intergenerational practices that have been upheld? I like those really that uh, you cannot explain by science or they may not make sense by science, but those are the things, the beliefs and the practices that you've met, and therefore you have to go by them. Yes, anybody to help us? Now I want your input. Yes, yeah. Regina. Yeah. I said the one that I've heard of is uh, if you're a married woman, mm -hmm. you don't wash in the night. If you're a married woman, but if you're not married, yeah. you can wash in the night. <laughs> That is what I've heard. You don't wash in the night because especially if your husband is around, it's no good. Why? Unless maybe something bad will happen to your husband or something of that sort. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> any other any other tradition and convention intergenerational practices? Hello, sir. Hello, yes. Please use the hand button so that I can see who, who wants to talk. So if you use that signal, I'm sure you've done online lectures, so you know what I'm talking about. Then I can I can call you by name. That sign with the hand, you'll click on that. Yes, Emmanuel. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, it has, or it is the tradition of uh, we Africans that when you want to marry, you go and seek permission uh, from oh, the. Those are not the things I'm religion. talking about. That one is is almost oh, yeah. worldwide. If you want to marry, you have to go to the family. But I'm talking about things like uh, the one that uh, Regina just spoke about not long ago. Um, oh. Yes. Yeah, so I've also heard about one from the away community. Yes. That uh, you don't sweep in the night. You don't you do it. You don't sweep. Sweep. Okay. Okay. In the night. Right. You know when you were a kid and they say certain things like that, you cannot ask questions or you mm -hmm. cannot argue over them. Mm -hmm. But growing up, I I got the understanding that. If you sweep in the night, you are likely to sweep a valuable thing away. Okay. So you don't see. You, you may lose. Beautiful. You know, exactly. maybe some golden stuffs uh -huh. that is very expensive those days. Okay. So you are likely to sweep them away and have them back. So it's mm. one of the tradition or from the African. Okay. Uh, Esther. Okay, I've also heard that you don't have to sink in the bathroom when you are bathing. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. But then I think the the what is behind it is that if you if you sing, you might swallow a uh, soap. Yeah. And but when you were young, they won't explain this to you, isn't it? Yeah, they will not explain. Nobody it to you. has time to explain to you. They will just tell you your mother will die. Uh, yes. Or something will happen to somebody. All right. Yeah. So those are some of the things. But still, we still have the Tuesday. Is it Tuesday or Thursday? Fishing. People don't have to go to the sea on a particular day. Which day is that? Um, I think Tuesday. And farming as Tuesday. well. And farming. Yeah, mm. Tuesday. I think uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, hey, Regina. Depends on yeah. the community. Bro. It depends on the community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know the Kakradi people, the Gan people, uh -huh. the Angolan, I mean the Keta side. Mm -hmm. people. Okay. So it depends on the day. I don't think the days are the same. Okay, that's fine. But Prof, yeah. The farming aspect, I experienced something when we were young, and um, mm -hmm. we used to go to the farm with my grandma. Mm -hmm. And then we were told that we are not supposed to go there on um, Tuesdays. Yeah. But at, at a point in time, we needed to go and then cultivate cassava. So on Tuesday, my grandma was not there. Mm -hmm. The children, we decided to go there. Mm -hmm. And then when we went, we were chased by some men with cutlass and all things. Eh? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So we're like, oh, so this is true. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so, <laughs> did you see if it's scam men or they yes, were dwarfs? we okay. did no i wanted to we did know Bro. whether they were Bro. real human beings Bro. yes they were real human Bro, beings i thought she would say snake oh no no snake. Bro, i thought she would say snake <laughs> no no no, no, no. I, was, human I, was, I, was, I was actually thinking about dwarfs or some super hey. <laughs> No, 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 no. If they were real, bro, yes, yes. I oh. also think maybe they might have caught a thief that day, but and only as their child, they don't know. That's why like they turn it rather chasing them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so, to run. Regina, that's why I want to know whether they were real human beings. <laughs> because if they were we real people, human beings, we saw people they, coming close to us, so yes. we decided to run. Exactly. With, the, with that notion that because today is Tuesday, people exactly. are following us. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yes, I get it. So my my point is that if if it was backed by supernatural things, then the, those people should have died as well. All right. So it's possible some, yes. as Regina is saying, some people are taking advantage of that and probably stealing on those th those days. All right. But that is not to underplay some of these things. You've also heard about so many stories of people that have lost their life because they went to the sea on a particular day or a farm on a particular day and so on and so forth. Okay. So... Basically, the point we want to establish is that this intergenerational practices helps us to set some traditions, some norms, some way of behavior. And most of the time, we don't even know why, but that is what we have been told, and we have to obey. Okay? The reasons, yes, when you grow up or as you learn, you may get to know some of them. It's just like the Sabbath day story. Uh, or don't go to farm on a particular day story. Maybe it's just there to help the people to rest on that particular day, all right? And not necessarily that if you go, some dwarf or some supernatural something will face or will, will catch you. Or if we take the soap example, it's just the science is that if you, if you actually bath while singing, some of the soap, which contains some chemicals, may get into your mouth. Uh, the sweeping thing, it could be that you could lose something valuable or if you have some food somewhere that is not closed by sweeping, some of the dust could get in there and so on and so forth. But whatever be the case, we have this to be part of our ethics or way of behavior. It has been passed from one generation to the other. Okay, so that is an important source of ethics. Then the next one is the various types of institutions, okay, like educational institution religious institutions, social institutions, they tend to influence our behavior, all right? And, and so you want to be careful about the education. Maybe you have grown, but you want to pay attention to the schools that your children attend and the type of things that they are teaching them, okay? All manner of things. You've, you've heard about all manner of syllables, all manner of belief systems, practices that uh, these modern schools want to actually... Uh, uh, train our kids with, okay? So you can get your ethical beliefs and systems based on the schools that you've attended. The same with religion, right? Whether you like it or not, the teachings that you hear from religious authority have a way of influencing your, your ethical behavior. So you have to choose your, your churches, now, even you, you may be able to make those decisions, but in explaining it, you want to be more careful about your children, all right? Some of the churches are almost like cults now, okay? You are in a church and you don't have independence of thinking because it's, it will serve the interest of the pastor or, or the malam or imam. So you have trained yourself at the, to the master's level. You don't have to allow emotions to cloud your judgment but religion the teachings from religious authority can can influence your ethical behavior okay to the extent that some people cut off their their parents right because some pastor says your mother is a witch your father is the one doing that and so on and so forth the, the stories and examples are many 
Okay, so you want to pay attention to religion because it can influence your ethical behavior. Social institutions, your friends, your colleagues that you move with. Peer pressure is not just something for teenagers, all right? Everybody at all can be influenced by peer pressure. Peer pressure just means your peers. And at any stage, you have colleagues, you have people like at that stage. And so they become your peers and they can influence your ethics as well. All right. Then we have nomological axioms. They are just like the intergenerational practices. Some saying, some belief systems that have gone on over a period of time. Most of the time, you can explain them logically, but you are supposed to simply obey. Okay, you are simply supposed to obey. And sometimes they put the other thing I wanted to say about this people that you guys uh, you saw when you were going to the farm on Tuesday. Sometimes the chiefs and the people want that practice to continue in a way that they may even set tax forces secretly to ensure that people don't disobey that particular type of practice. So they may not have anything supernatural, but they basically want people to respect that practice. And so they will find a way to ensure that that axiom or that practice continues. Okay. Then another source of ethics, that's what, I, when I was talking about religion, I almost touched on this. So knowledge, wisdom, and experience. You might have heard so many things growing up. Pastors and malams and religious authorities might have said a lot of things. But as you grow in knowledge and wisdom and experience, you should be able to discern which of these practices, which of these sayings make sense and what doesn't make sense anymore. So that you now don't live your life based on what somebody else has said, but based on the knowledge you have acquired, your wisdom in life, you can decide for yourself what really is right and what is wrong. Okay, so our knowledge, wisdom, and experience can, can help us, can be an important source of our ethical behavior. All right? Yes. So most of the time, what you, you might think is whatever and you are shouting, somebody who has gone through some experience will just be looking at you and be laughing, right? Because they feel you don't have enough knowledge about what you are talking about. Okay. Then part of the social institution, we spoke about family and friends. Yes, so they can influence you a lot in terms of your ethical behavior. And now, uh, whatever, in our politics, family and whatever is, is creating a problem. We have not traced the corruption to that level, but that is where most of the problems of politicians are coming from. Once you get appointment, have you been paying attention to the vetting of ministers? Okay, the chiefs, from the area will come, your family members will come. It's almost like <laughs> you've been given some gold mine, all right? Because the impression is that you've, you've now been given a position where you can make money and, and share with the family and friends and, and people closer to you, all right? So they influence our ethical behavior. And your bid to satisfy them, most of the time, that can lead you to behave unethically. Okay. Any questions on this ones? Are we okay? Are we fine? Okay. Yes, sir. Good. So let's move on. So we have some scholars that have developed uh, some theories around moral development. So there are two. We have called back and Gilligan's theories of moral development, all right? So they both developed three stages when it comes to human beings and how they develop morally, all right? They basically spoke about three stages. So we have the pre-conventional, we have the conventional, and we have post-conventional, all right? However, Colbeck concentrated on males, okay? And he also subdivided each of the three stages into two. So in all, if you were looking at Kohlberg's theory of moral development, you will get about six stages or steps, but they all fall under the three broad category of moral uh, stages of moral development, which are 
pre-conventional level, conventional level, and post-conventional level. Okay. So according to Colbeck, when you take the male child or the male human being, the their level of their learning about what is right and how to behave right is first and foremost driven by punishment. Okay. So the fear of being punished and, and drive them to obey laws and regulations and instructions and so on and so forth. And if you have a male child or a boy, it, it, it makes sense. Okay. It is far easier to, to, for the female to behave well and to obey than when you have boys. All right. So his argument is that boys learn about ethics and moral development initially based on punishment and obedience driven. So you have to beat them and beat them and beat them in order for them to do the right or not to do the button. All right. So punishment is the motivation that will get them to do the right and or behave morally. All right. Then the next stage is self-interest driven. So let me explain the three broad categories or stages. The pre-conventional level is largely thinking about yourself and your interest. Okay. When you come, we come to the conventional level, that is where you now want to think about society. You want to please society within which you find yourself. The post-conventional level is where you go beyond society. It's almost like you are coming to the pre-conventional level. But this time around, you're making decisions based on what you think to be right and not what society thinks. All right. When I was explaining, I think, knowledge and wisdom and experience, I told you that now you've grown, you've educated yourself. So most of the decisions should not be based on the practices that they, they spoke to you about when you were growing up, or it shouldn't largely be based on religious teaching, but you should be able to make independent decisions based on your knowledge, your experience, your wisdom. So that is the point where you get to what is known as the post-conventional level. Are we fine with the three? So pre-conventional level is about your interest. And most of the time it's driven by fear. All right. You are obeying because you are afraid to be punished. That is your interest. You don't want to be punished and therefore you behave morally. All right. The self-interest is like, you will get something if you behave morally. Most of the time, if you're a child or whatever, a parent, you find a way to motivate your, your child to behave the things that you ask the person to do. Okay, so there will be a reward system. Whether it may be toughies, it may be more money, or allowing the person to watch more television, there is always some reward system that you put in place. And that then helps the person. So that is still self-interest. The person is behaving well, not because they want to, but because they want to get some reward from that. Sometimes the reward could be the avoidance of punishment, the earlier point that we spoke about, right? They don't want to be punished, and so they behave well. So the, the whole moral behavior is not because they want to but because they want to protect their interest, all right? So if we come to the conventional level, I said that is where you want to please society. So good intentions as defined by so social consensus. So your good intentions are not really based on what you believe are the good intentions, but because society says those are the right things to do, okay? And once again, it's because you feel that if you go contrary to what society wants, you may be punished, like stage one, or you may not get some reward systems, like the next one that we're coming to look at. So society has people in authority, people in positions that have the capacity to reward you if you behave as society wants. Okay, so you tend to develop these good intentions because you want to meet the requirements or the standards of society. It is not the intentions are not really your intention, but you will behave in that way because society wants you to. Okay. So the next one is similar. Authority and social order 
obedience driven. So you behaving well and so on and so forth because we have authority in society that is compelling you. So if you take, say, let's take, say, the police, we have the court system and so on and so forth. Say so that if you behave wrongly, this, when we're talking about law, we said it's backed by force, okay? These institutions of force or power will let you face certain consequences. So in order not to go against authority and the social order that has been put in place, that is what is motivating you to behave in the right way. Then we have the post-conventional level, where now the individual or the male person comes to realize that he or he has a social contract with society. So if you the social contract idea is that you now feel society has contributed to your well-being. And so it is your responsibility to behave in a way that is right to our society. So right now, it's not as if it's the society that is putting pressure on you or you want to do that which is right because there is some authority watching over you. It is just your own self-realization that society has done a lot for you and therefore you have some social contract not to behave in a way that will destroy the society that has helped you develop and help you achieve your dreams or whatever it is, all right? Then the last point is very similar. You come to a point where your behavior is driven by universal ethical principles. So it is no longer based on what they have told you when you were growing up, okay? Because as much as some of them may be reasonable, a lot of them don't make sense, okay? A lot of them don't make sense. So you've come to a point where you want to pick what you think universally makes sense as far as ethical behavior is concerned, all right? We have uh, a practice like female genital mutilation, right? Isn't it? Uh, we have practices like depo and, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So depend upon your level of education and, and stuff like that. You may not want your, your, your child, if even you have done it, you may not allow your child to be subjected to those kinds of practices because you've come to realize that even though in your community or society they were accepted, when you benchmark those practices against universal ethical principles, they don't really make sense. And therefore, you'll not, you may not want to uh, follow them. Is that point clear? And by this, if you are in that society, I'm not saying they don't make sense. So I'm just using that as an example. Maybe if you are from there, they may have very logical reasons why they may have to continue with that. But from my universal ethical principles, I don't think they should, there should be things that should continue. So that the post-conventional is where you've come to a point where you can do independent analysis of practices, belief systems, and now decide on what you want to follow because you think those uh, principles that you have decided on can be universally applied or make sense universally. Are we clear? Any questions on this stages of moral development? So, yes, so, sir. Yep. Please. Uh... I want to believe that uh, a level, let's say level one or level two may affect level three in a person's uh, moral development. Is that right, sir? So we'll come to the criticisms and I think that should be number one or two criticism of this theory. Okay. The fact that Thank it will overlap, yes. And the fact that these stages may not be that orderly some level in stage two may start before stage one and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, so yes, it, they were criticized or the scholar was criticized with this particular question that you just raised. Regina. All right. Thank you, Prof. I also want to say is that, that just like the Abraham Maslow theory of a, mm -hmm. somebody may start from what the post-conventional level. Mm -hmm. that 
based on the society and the fear that that person finds himself mm -hmm. maybe coming towards the three level rather. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. because someone may be knowledgeable, have things, and maybe will find themselves to another geographical area, then realize that no, this environment does mm -hmm. not match with what I know. So you have to come to their level. That's right. So I think personally, uh, where the conventional level is, a lot of people behave orderly at the workplace just because of the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. And you think they are nice. Mm -hmm. But when you are with them in the house, mm -hmm. that place, there's no authority checking you. Being this. So you could see there are different people. So That's you say, right. oh, this person is nice. This, but when you met this person outside, mm -hmm. you realize that, no, this person is a different person altogether. Right. So I, I just want to raise this issue that it's good that he has said it this way, but some people were at the last level, which is the post-conventional level, but situation will cause you to be at the pre-conventional <laughs> level. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so these are all like, criticisms for for this particular type of theory but the important thing for us is first to know the stages first okay we have to know what the stages mean and then we can then raise some criticisms against that so criticisms against Kohlberg's stage theory of moral development one says moral development does not necessarily follow a certain order as demonstrated by Kohlberg as a result the consequential order is unconvincing, all right? And I think the two questions that you raised fall under this. So the order that he has given, many feel it could take several forms and not necessarily the punishment and so on and so forth, okay? So another criticism is that even if a progression in moral development may be seen, the, the stages themselves may overlap or be skipped. All right. And I think the first question also falls under this. So the stages may overlap. How one stage, one can move from, say, one and get to um, stage five. Okay. One to three and so on and so forth and skip some of the levels. So that was another criticism. Because Kohlberg primarily addressed the male pattern of moral development and ignored uh, the gender perspective, the outcome is biased. So another criticism is that the scholar only looked at males, okay? They did not look at female, all right? So we have Carol Gilligan's theory of moral development. So according to Gilligan, care and compassion are the primary motivators for moral development in women. So whilst Kohlberg was looking at male or men, Gilligan was looking at women, all right? He has, she also has three levels, but in her case, she doesn't have the sub sub ones that Kohlberg had, okay? So she, but her main argument is that when it comes to the moral development of women, it is based on their, their traits of having a lot of care and compassion, okay? But at the primary conventional stage, a woman's primary objective at this point is survival. So just like the male where it was about self-interest, you remember that. I explained to you that even the punishment or self-interest is because they want to avoid punishment. That is why they will behave in a way that is right. So yeah. for female as well or women as well, at the primary or pre-conventional stage, their moral development is based on survival, all right? The big difference comes in at the conventional stage. And don't forget that we said the conventional stage is the society putting pressure and society telling you as a woman, you should be this way, as a man, you should be this way. So at the conventional stage, at this point, a woman realized that self-sacrifice can contribute to her life's goodness. So this is where the care and compassion that the scholar was talking about comes in. So women at the conventional stage do a lot of self-sacrifice. And, and all of us, that is why women's, what, is it women's day or mother's day? Mother's day is celebrated. 
like that. And when it's Father's Day, it's almost like there is no day. Okay. <laughs> it's because of the self-sacrifice of, of women. All right. So at the conventional stage, they give a lot. They sell their clothing. They do all manner of odd jobs in order to help their children and so on and so forth to, to be able to educate themselves and so on and so forth. Okay. But this is the, the general issue. We also know about females that are very wicked, right? And can kill and can kill their children, their own children, and sell their children, and so on and so forth. But generally, okay, women tend to have a lot of care and compassion. They have a lot of self-sacrifice, and they will do everything to make sure that, especially their children, the welfare of their children are catered for. And I believe it's at that conventional stage, as much as it's a natural instinct, I think over time, women have seen their mothers behave that way. Society have praised them for behaving that way. And so if you're a woman and you get to that stage, that is the same type of behavior you want to replicate, all right? You want to sacrifice for uh, other people, and that becomes the conventional stage for their moral development. Okay, but at the post-conventional stage, a woman realizes that satisfying her desire no longer justifies the means. She, she searches for alternative, alternatives not to injure herself or others. All right, so this is the stage where now they now come to think about themselves. It's just like the men, where now it is not about society, but it is you now coming to realization that no, even though I've been sacrificing, if I don't take care of myself, I might die and leave the children that I claim to be looking after. Okay. Or whatever care and compassion that I'm giving, I have to make sure that I don't injure myself. I don't wound myself. I don't hurt myself in my bid to support and help other people. So at the post-conventional stage, the self-sacrifice is minimized a bit. They will still help, but now they also become conscious that it is important to also think about their well-being or welfare as much as they want to help other people in, in their environment. Okay. Is it clear? Say it's clear, but uh, to me, I think a uh, Carol G is it Gilgan did well. Uh, but the conventional stage is true. We women we made a lot of sacrifices, but I think some people don't realize themselves to the post-conventional stage. But is the society rather that push them? Mm -hmm. Some women they don't mature enough to realize that no, I need to take care of myself mm -hmm. and take care of others. Mm -hmm. But there are sacrifices that they are making and they feedback they are getting from the people they mm -hmm. are doing the sacrifice to who right. push them to say no i am no longer going to do this any that's longer right. that's right but i'll rather look after Take care myself. Of myself first before yes. i think about other people yes not that they naturally decided or realized themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, no, but you see the, the post convention no the post conventional stage you get to that based on experiences so it's oh, okay. not like one day you make that decision. No, no, no. It's based on okay. the experiences, the, experiences. Life, the knowledge okay. that you have acquired yeah. that okay. will finally help you to come to that realization. Okay. okay. It's just like the myth. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The knowledge you have acquired, the whatever that you have acquired, you say, no, no, no. These people have been lying to me all this while. Yeah. So right yeah. now, I'm no longer I'm going no to longer. Live uh, yeah. this way because of that. All right. So all of that is part. The way people have treated you and all that helps you to move from conventional to post-conventional state. Samson? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. But Regina, be you see your, your, your sign, your hand button, instead of just talking. Okay, sir, Samson, please. Oh, I raised my sign. I, I thought you have seen it too. I did. It's okay. <laughs> Samson, yes. Sir, please. Uh... Now, we would have also noticed that mm -hmm. the people passing through the pre-conventional stage to the conventional stage, and with all the experiences gathered, they have realized that, in fact, uh, 
they have to, there is a need to move to the post conventional, but yet still, some way, somehow, they still remain at that <laughs> conventional stage. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how then do we refer to this kind of people? Ah, why do you want to refer to them some way? <laughs> eh? it's, oh, it's, it's like, no, no, it's, it's like mm -hmm. from all experiences gathered, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is not going anywhere, or enough mm -hmm. is enough. Yeah. But they still remain there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are people that societal pressure is, is a lot of pressure. Uh, anybody here who has tried changing a church before, like moving from where you worship and you want to go to a new church? Yes, it's, I have changed. And the way, Samson, the way you are talking, you can change. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, <laughs> if you have interacted with church members, eh? There are people that are dying in their current place of worship, right? The place that they fellowship and so on and so forth. But they don't have that strength. Okay? They will give themselves all manner of excuses why they have to still continue to worship there. And here, I'm not just talking about holy church. I'm talking about mock's place of worship, whatever your belief is. All right? So there is some pressure. It will take a lot of independent thinking and inner strength to be able to break the pattern of society, uh, societal expectations. And it's not easy. So it is not as if everybody will get to the post-conventional stage. Okay? Yes. Sometimes if you go to back home, even with all your degrees, they will still ask you to do certain things and you can't say no. <laughs> you can't say no. Once you get to and you forget about all that, the lectures you've had, and you go back to those same practices. So it's not very, very easy. You need a lot of inner strength, independent thinking and thoughts to be able to move away from conventional to post-conventional stage. Okay? And a good example is, is living, living church. Even when you are hurting, uh, sermons are targeted at you, pastor is doing all manner of things and you want to leave, it will take a lot of strength on your part to be able to, to leave. Okay? Yeah, you guys follow when the story of even a pastor comes up. How the church members that are know about this, how they will still come and defend their pastors. All right? Esther? Yeah, another example can be domestic violence. That's right. Uh, when when the, the woman was being beaten and all that, That's still right. because of society pressure, I don't mm -hmm. want people to talk about this. Mm -hmm. They still remain in the marriage good and example. suffer to that. Very good yeah. example. Yeah, uh, there is this. I think Nigerian musician, right, who who finally had to lose her life. Yes. Very powerful musician, right? And her case became worse because she's a gospel musician. And she's probably thinking about all this, what society will say that she has gone through divorce or something like that. So she, she finally had to sacrifice her own life in her quest to please society. Okay, so it's, it's not very, very easy at all to, to kind of do away with societal pressure. Okay, so let's look at similarities uh, between Colbeck and Gilligan's theories of moral development. So they present cognitive development theories. What it means is that at least the, uh, the scholars help us to know, in theory, how people develop their morality, okay? If you want to think about it or read about it, there is something that helps in explaining that. They agree that there are three stages of moral development. So we have the pre-conventional, conventional and we have post conventional both scholars believe that they prove that moral development takes place through stages they came to the conclusion that moral development at the mature stage is better than at the pre-conventional stage all right and i hope we all agree to that because at the post conventional you go beyond the norms of society and we say some of these things may not be right and so you can now come to make decisions that you think are good for you. The studies, the studies seem to suggest that, or their studies seems to suggest that moral standard of a person is a relative concept. 
and gradually take shape in the process of evolution over time. All right, that is also the idea that we get. Most of us will start from our parents and how they, they treated us at home, all right? The punishment stage, the self-interest stage, before we now graduate to society, then we now graduate to our own independence where we can make decisions. And these things take time, okay? It takes time before you get to the stage where you can make your own decisions. Okay. Yes, so these are the differences. Because we've taken a lot of time explaining that, I, I guess we should be able to read them and understand. So I'll just rush through them. So we call back theory, the emphasis is on right-based analysis. Okay, so for the male, it's about their rights and how to protect their rights. With Gilligan's, it's care-based analysis. With female, it's all about giving care, all right, to other people. That is their main trust. Kohlbeck's theory believes in six distinct stages of development. Gilligan had three distinct stages. Uh, Kohlbeck considers only the male pattern development. Gilligan's considers only the female pattern of development. Kohlbeck looks at personal relationship with others. It's not it's not a decisive factor in moral development of an individual. So because this is about their right or self-interest, it's not about how they, they, other, they care for other people. It's about their own right. So their personal relationship with others doesn't really influence them so much in their moral and their ethical decision-making. Okay. The example that Esther Evelyn just gave with um, abuses, domestic abuse you know male when they make the decision to go they just leave right they don't care about whatever but the female most times they stay beyond societal pressure most times because of their kids okay we have children i have to be there to take care of them and so on and so forth so they are not making the decisions based on their personal interests but because of other people okay so gilligan's personal relationship is the basis of moral development when we're dealing with the female. Then last callbacks, love and care do not decide the trajectory of moral growth for men. For women, everything is based on love and care. And I think we've gone through this. Okay, so let's look at some other concepts. So we have what is known as ethical absolution or absolutism. Hmm. The zim zim words are difficult to pronounce. So ethical absolution is the ethical position that there are unchangeable moral benchmarks that may be used to determine whether a particular action is right or wrong, regardless of the circumstances surrounding it. So when we're dealing with ethical absolution, uh, the decision maker has no choice, okay? So we have benchmarks that you have to do or not to do something, regardless of the circumstances. Okay. So if you look at, say, uh, security guys and those employees at the lower level, most of the time when their boss gives them instruction, that is it. Regardless of circumstance, my boss says I shouldn't open the gate. All right. So what the, the unchangeable be moral benchmarks there are things that you cannot do anything about, whether it makes sense or not, you just have to obey. So that is the concept of ethical absolution, okay? It contains that morality is innate in the natural principles of the universe, human nature, the will of God, or some other fundamental source. The idea of ethical absolution is likely the basis of any ethical philosophy that places a great emphasis on individuals' rights and obligations. So with ethical absolution, for example, thou shall not murder or kill. It's, it's like an absolute. What it means is that there cannot be any circumstance under which where murder can be justified. Okay, so that is an example of that. And why is that the case? The argument could be that it is the will of God. That is what God wants, okay? 
or universally when you kill, there is no society where killing somebody can be considered to be something that you can justify. So that is the idea of ethical absolution. All right. So, but in reality, we know that that could create problems, isn't it? Even the law makes provision for circumstances where you can actually kill. Regina, I can see you. Yes, I was about to ask about the law aspect. Right. Where they will say it's a self defense and all that thing. Exactly. So that is the point I'm trying to make. So ethical absolution doesn't give room for that. Okay, whether you are being raped and you needed to defend yourself, whether it was armed robbers that came and you needed to also defend yourself, when it comes to ethical absolution, the law or the divine whatever is that thou shall not kill and thou shall not murder. Okay, so let's look at criticisms against ethical absolution. So the main criticism to ethical absolution is the method by which we determine what the unchanging moral practices are. So the real question is who, who brought about the unchanging moral practices? For example, that shall not kill. Who came to tell us that if you kill, it is wrong? And therefore, at all circumstances, thou shall not kill. I don't know whether you are getting the point. Okay, maybe let me throw in one that one that will make it nice example. Uh, like thou shall not fornicate or commit adultery. Okay, we can relate to that one faster. So who who came to tell us that, and and why is it? Why should it be a standard that we cannot actually uh, go against? So that is the first criticism. All right. So it is we who have decided that this is should be absolute. Where is it coming from? What force is telling us that this is an absolute law? Then under all circumstances, we should obey. Next one, huge varieties of moral beliefs exist today among countries, which implies that there cannot be a single true morality. So very close to this, depend upon the country, the community within which you find yourself, morality can vary across board. And that makes absolution very difficult to achieve. Okay. The, the issue about um, adultery, fornication, we even have society where less even incest, right? Where if you marry and you took care of the, the your wife well, this the family will add their sister, the sister of your wife to you. Okay? But this is also ahead of in, in <laughs> other countries in other communities. So who are you now? <laughs> who are you to be telling me that I should not commit? <laughs> I should not commit adultery or no, even in says they said yes, if I take care of your my the sister well, they can add more to me. All right. It may sound weird because you don't come from that particular community, but that tells you yeah. the variety of moral beliefs that exist, not just in countries, but even in communities and tribes within a particular country. All right. So it creates a problem when we want to go by the standards of ethical absolution, where we just say that this is it and everybody must follow no matter the circumstances, all right? The last one is a consequentialist who argue that it cannot be proper for a moral absolutist to be unprepared to kill one person in order to stop the deaths of countless others, okay? So for the consequentialist to be able to determine whether something is uh, ethical or not, it's based on the consequences. So for them, if you will kill one person, for example, and save the life of, say, 30 or 10 or even two persons, it makes logical sense. It is ethical to kill because if you kill one person, you can protect two or five or 10 people. Okay, so the consequentialists will tell the moral absolutists that it doesn't make sense that one person probably an armed robber is shooting around or whatever. How do they call them? 
a serial suicide something wants to go and kill thousands of people and because you believe that thou shall not kill you'll not kill that one person and allow that one person to go and kill thousands of people it will not make sense to the consequentialist all right so those are the criticisms against ethical absolution then let's go for the reverse side, ethical relativism. So it argues that different societies or individuals hold different views on what constitutes morally correct or immoral behavior. We've just seen that. So another good example is polygamy. Okay, so polygamy is one of the best illustrations of this idea. Polygamy is, is permitted in some parts of the world but viewed as morally or legally unacceptable in other parts, all right? So if you go to Europe, it, they, they abhor it like the way we don't also like same-sex marriage, or how do you call it, homosexuals, all right? Just as they hate polygamy and the hatred for it is just as we don't also like what they want us to now practice. So what is right and what is wrong really is based on where you find yourself in, in the globe, all right? So ethical standards are relative to a situation, place, time, and circumstances. By all means, when things are normal, don't care. But that cannot be said if there is an armed robber in your house trying to kill you to take your assets or property. By all means, in normal circumstances, don't harm anybody. But the same cannot be said if somebody is trying to rape you or your daughter or something of that sort, okay? So that is the idea of ethical relativism. What is ethical is subject or relative to a situation, a place, time, and circumstances. That should tell you when to behave in a particular way. But this is also not without criticisms. So the relativist lack justification to hold others accountable for misbehavior. So if you believe in ethical relativism, what it means is that it will be very, very difficult for you to, to hold somebody accountable for any type of behavior they put up. Why? Because the person can always give a reason why they did what they did. Okay? So you, you said that is the circumstance. So for example, if somebody uh, stole went to your farm to steal your food stuff or wherever, came to your house and stole your money. As an ethical relativist, you cannot hold the person liable or accountable for misbehavior because they can justify. Maybe they are hungry. Uh, maybe they need money for their mom's operation or they themselves have some terminal illness that if they don't deal with, they will die. And you said that circumstances should help you to decide what is right or wrong. So under this circumstance, they feel justified to have stolen your money in order to deal with their emergency. Okay? So if you go with uh, relativism, then what it means is that you cannot hold anybody accountable for misbehavior because people can always justify their misbehavior. Okay. So the next subsequent points are very similar to the main logic that I've just established. Because evil cannot exist in relativism, relativists are unable to complain about the issue of evil. So it's coming from point one, okay? Because you've already indicated that there is no evil anywhere. Anybody at all can justify whatever they do. And if that is the case, then you have no business complaining when people do what is wrong. Relativism does not support assigning blame or receiving compliments. That is the point. So you cannot assign blame because there is a reason for that. You cannot give compliments because there must be a reason why the person did that. It's not just because they want to appear good, but the circumstances require that they behave that way. They behave that way, and therefore, there is no need for any type of compliments. Relativists are not permitted to assert unfairness or injustice. Why? Because they don't have standards. And at any point in time, people can justify their unfair behavior or unjust behavior. Relativism leaves no room for improvement. 
Because no matter the type of behavior you have, you can always give reason why you behave in that way. Okay? So as much as absolute, absolutism has its problem, relativism is not also the way to go. Because if we don't have absolute standards in place, then we cannot hold anybody liable because anybody or everybody can justify their type of behavior. If they are killing, they will have a reason. If they are stealing, they should have a reason. Whatever they are doing, they are likely to have a reason. And that is the criticism against this uh, particular view. Then we move to ethical pluralism. It's almost like relativism, okay? So it's an alternative to both ethical absolution and relativism, but I view it as almost like relativism. So moral pluralists have said that I said that there are numerous moral truths that cannot be unified into single principle. The pluralist does not believe that all frames are equal. So for the pluralist, just like relativism, the context or the situation should determine how to establish your ethical standards. What is right, what is not wrong. It cannot just be one thing cutting across. Okay, so if we're dealing with murder, for the pluralists, there should be a murder, for example, for normal times. There should be where you are not allowed to murder somebody or kill somebody. Uh, there should be a framework for a murder when you are in trouble. Okay, where if it is rape, if it is armed robbery, then probably you are justified to be able to do that. So the argument is that you can't just have one single principle and say that that principle should cut across at all times. You can have different, different principles and, and fit them in based on the circumstance, the time, and so on and so forth, which is similar to the argument of relativism. Okay. Criticisms against ethical pluralism. The acceptance of various ethical frameworks prevents adherence of ethical pluralism from effectively, effectively criticizing beliefs, behaviors, institutions, and other things that are actually flawed. So it's very similar to the explanation that I gave with relativism, all right? Once you make room for different, different principles, then when people commit their wrong or evil, they can find themselves a principle that justify whatever they have done. And therefore it becomes very difficult to actually criticize those types of behaviors, okay? Are we fine? Are we following? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's look at four critical principles of ethics. Four critical principles of ethics. So we have one known as the ego based principle. And it says that human actions are primarily egocentric and selfish. Adam Smith noted, however, that some effects of individual greed might promote societal welfare by meeting basic human needs. Okay, so if you have read some bit of economics, you, you'll learn about the fact that the baker is not just baking his bread because he wants the welfare of society, but he knows that there will be some returns if they choose to sell their bread. Okay, so that is where that point is coming from. But ego-based principle basically means that in making my decisions with respect to what is ethical or not, I should consider myself first. I should look at my interest in whatever decisions that I'm making, okay? So it shouldn't be about other people, circumstances. No, it should be about me when I'm making a particular decision. In theory, this looks like it is bad or because of the word selfish, egocentric, but most of the time, whether we like it or not, that is how we make our decisions, all right? If you don't uh, know about this, in fact, you can get into a lot of trouble when you live your life just thinking about policing other people. I think from the moral development, we've established this particular point. So it may sound selfish, it may sound bad, but in real essence, 
many times you need to be thinking about yourself, especially when you want to take ethical behavior. And thinking about yourself, yes, yeah, about thinking about consequences as a, and also the rewards that will come to you as a result of that particular behavior, okay? So if you're at a workplace, for example, and your boss is asking you to manipulate some figures because that may help him or her to make a lot of money, uh, you need to, to be careful because at the end of the day, you'll be the one who has actually signed or uh, committed that particular offense that led to your boss making money. So under that circumstance, you should be thinking more about yourself than your superior that wants to use you to make more money. Okay, so the ego-based principle is think about yourself whenever you're making some decisions. How will this decision affect me in the future or now? Then we have the rule-based principle. So according to this notion, moral behavior should be guided by predetermined ethical standards. In this situation, the open action is what counts, not the repercussions. So with rule-based principle, from the name, you have some rules in place. You have some standards in place. So when you want to make a decision, just go by what the standard says if you want to stay safe. All right? So there may be some policies in your organization. Rule-based principle says, I won't even worry and be thinking whether to do it or not. I will just read or know the policies of my organization and go by the policies. Okay. The problem is that sometimes the policy will, may not make sense given the circumstance or the times that you find yourself. But it is your choice whether you want to go by the policy and stay safe or you want to take a risk by breaking the policy and get yourself into trouble, okay? So in this situation, the open action is what counts. Did you actually, so when there's a problem, all that your bosses or your management will do is to come out with a policy, okay? Even when it results in something beneficial, that is not what they will be looking at. They want to know whether you follow the policy of the organization. So that is the rule-based principle, where you make your ethical decisions based on predetermined ethical standards. And here we're talking about laws, we're talking about policies, we're talking about rules and regulations. If you were to follow them, then you can see, you can consider yourself to have behaved ethically, right? But as I said, for each of the principles, they have their positives and negatives. For example, in this rule-based, I was talking about security people and their adherence to what their bosses tell them. Can you mute your mic? Or whoever spoke, I could hear that. Mute your mic. Okay. So I was talking about security people and their this is and it's not me. religious adherence to to what their bosses tell them, okay? To the extent that where it should make sense for them to even open a particular gate, they will not do it. That is the, the negative side. So probably there is an emergency, there is some shortcut to probably the emergency ward or somewhere. And yet because the boss, they have asked him not to allow people to pass, they will, they will not allow even accident victims to use that particular entrance. All right, so that is the downside of this. But that particular employee is safe because he has actually gone by the policy of the organization. Then we have end-based principle. So this moral precept is founded on the idea that acts have consequences. An action is only conducted when it has some benefits or favorable outcomes. So here people look at, they define or take their ethical decisions based on the consequences or the outcomes of those decisions. So they will weigh, if I was to do it, this, what will happen to me? And so on and so forth. Once they feel there won't be any consequences, they will actually go ahead and do that. Or once they feel there will be serious consequences, they refrain from doing that particular activity. So their ethical decisions are not based on 
on rules, laws, or what they feel is right, they basically will be making decisions based on outcomes that will come from those decisions. What it means is that if they have to behave unethically and they feel they will get some reward from that, they are prepared to do that. And at, work, at workplace, we, we see that all the time, especially if the instruction is coming from spirits and you think by doing that, you get a favor from your bosses. People are prepared to do that, okay? So as a lecturer, most of the time you get calls from colleagues or people from the top, maybe concerning their war, their female friends. I don't want to say girlfriends, huh? to change some grade, to do something for that person. And you know the person is in a position of power, right? Maybe sometimes you may also need something from that person. Or the person is in a position to determine whether you be promoted or not. So at that point, some people will not make decisions based on rules or based on whether what they want to do is right or wrong. They will basically be looking at the rewards or the consequences of that decision. So some and most people make decisions based on the end-based principles of ethics. All right. Then we have the last one known as the care-based principle. So it is revered as the golden rule in ethics. In this rule, the action of an agent is based on care or compassion. This overrules all other principles and, and it's of essence of all religious teachings. Okay. So there are others that will make their decisions based on care. And care... They are not looking at, um, what did we say at first? They are not looking at themselves. Ego. They are not looking at the laws or principles. They are not looking at the end-based issue. They are simply thinking about the other person and making those decisions. Okay? So if you uh, read the parable of the Samaritan, good Samaritan, do you remember those, uh, that story? If you are a Muslim, sorry, and there is a parable in the Bible <laughs> known as the Good Samaritan. It's very popular. You can go and search for it. Okay. It was meant to illustrate how what true serving God really means. Okay. We have religious people passing by. So pastors, imams passing by. And somebody that was considered to be a sinner actually foregoing his or her own interest because really the person who was hurt wasn't the family member, okay? He was going to spend a lot of money to cater for that person. He didn't look at the consequences because if you look at the story, the person who was hurt was hurt by robbers, armed robbers. What it means is that in your bid to stop and help this person, these same crooks, or people could have come to attack the person, okay? He didn't look at rules. Maybe the person is a Jew, and Samaritans are not supposed to have anything to do with Jews, and so on and so forth. So that story gives an example of K-based principle, where you don't make decisions based on all the other things. If you take, uh, say, end base, in fact, he was the one going to spend money, Okay, he was going to send a person to hospital, the inn, he was going to make some deposits and so on and so forth. So in natural sense, he was going to rather waste his money and resources in catering for this person who was attacked by the ambulance. Okay, so in the care-based principle, all the other principles are not important. You're simply making your decisions based on care and compassion. As much as it is good and sounds nice, it can also land you into a lot of trouble. All right. Let me give you an example. If you're a lecturer, um, the natural tendency is probably when a student can, based on care and compassion, he has filled his exams. Oh, my, this, they have all manner of stories that they say. Okay. Care and compassion is just to find. Uh, unethical or illegal way to get marks for the person. Sometimes you may want to adjust the marks for the person, all right, for the person to pass, maybe largely based on care and compassion. 
that that makes sense for that principle. But think about the other side. If the story was to break, somebody was out there and knew about this this person that the person didn't even come to write exams, and yet the person has passed the particular paper, and it becomes something for some disciplinary committee to to investigate that. What will be your position? Okay, as far as your your job or your work is concerned. So as much as in theory looks nice, we want to be very, very careful because that can also land you into trouble, a lot of trouble in reality, okay? So the ego base looks very worse in theory, but I said pay attention because most times you have to be thinking about that. In theory, K-based principle looks very nice, but think about it well in reality because in reality that can also land you into a lot of trouble, all right? Are we fine up to this point? Are yes, the sir. principles clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's look at the implications of the four principles of ethics. So the first one is this, these principles. Regan, I'll get to you. Let me finish with this. Keep your question. I'll call it. This principle suggests that in the same situation, different decisions can be arrived at, depend on the merits, a particular principle can be applied. So whenever you have to make a decision, all of these things will come to your mind. Should I make the decision based on my ego or my interest? Should I make the decision based on rules? Should I make the decision based on what I can get? Or should I just do it based on care and compassion? All right? You have to think through and look at which principle will apply in your particular case to, to, to use, okay? So depend upon the inclination of the user, any one of the principles can be translated into practice, all right? So most of us tend to be inclined, depend upon your upbringing, your whatever ethical orientation, your moral development, they will normally have a default position, okay? Whether it is ego, whether it is rule-based, whether it is uh, end, whether it's care based, we have our default position when it comes to taking these decisions. But we have to always be checking distance because they can also create problems for us if we are not careful. Okay, point three, there are four ways of looking at the world through the lens of ethics. It cannot be said that one principle is better than the other. All right, so that makes criticizing people even difficult because whilst you may be interpreting the decision based on ego-based, one person will be looking at it from the perspective of rule-based. Another will be looking at it from end-based. Another may be looking at it from care-based, all right? So we have four ways of looking at things in this world. All right, let's look at other two concepts, critical concepts in ethics. We have what is known as cognitivism and non-cognitivism. Okay, before I get there, Regina, your hand also. Oh, sorry, it was a mistake. Okay. Yeah. So cognitivism, the branch of ethical philosophy that claims that it is possible to know right from wrong or good from bad in a very clear and objective manner. So that's what that branch of ethical philosophy says we can know wrong from good okay right from wrong or good from bad, bad in a very objective manner so what it means is that we can also estimate say if we do good the kind of returns we can get from doing good because we know wrong in a very clear and objective manner we can tell the consequences that will come upon us if we if we to do that which is wrong, that is cognitivism. We can reason out and tell if we do right, what are the rewards? If we do bad, what are the consequences? Okay, it embraces ethical theories such as utilitarianism, religious based morality, and consequentialism and non consequentialism. So utilitarianism is basically the benefits. All right, if I was to take a particular decision, what kind of rewards will I will get from that decision? The more the benefits outweighs the cost, 
then what it means is that that decision is right. So cognitivism assumes that at any point in time you want to make an ethically related decision, you can have a fair idea of the type of returns or benefit that you can get from that decision, and that will help you to make that de uh, decision. And it falls under the theory of utilitarianism. As I said, we'll be looking at that, the theories in lecture three. Then we have religious-based morality. That also, if you look at religious teaching, they are more, most of the time motivated by some type of reward, all right? If you do good, you end up in heaven, all right? If you are evil, you end up in hell. So it's based on the return rewards that will cause you to either obey those things or not, all right? So they are motivated by either a positive reward or by fear to cause you to do that which is right. What it means is that in clear terms, religious teachings will help you to know the kind of returns that you should be receiving. They can put a, a measure or a value to that. And that value could be say, you'll become more prosperous or you may go to heaven and so on. The negative side is the fact that you'll suffer in life or you may end up in hell. All right. Let's look at non-cognitivism. Non it maintains that it is not objectively possible to know what is good and what is bad. Non-cognitive theories include deontological theory and natural law-based theory of rights. So with non-cognitivism, we cannot subject good or bad to analysis to the extent that we can get to know the kind of returns we can get if we were to do good or the kind of the extent of punishment or consequences we we'll get if we were to do bad. Okay. So the theories basically are found that it's almost like by force. It's a duty to do what is right. All right. It is not because you may get some reward or get some return. No. The ontological duty says that you have a duty to do what is right. Natural law based theory says people have rights. You don't have to kill. Uh, you don't have to do that. And it's not because if you don't kill, somebody will pay you for not killing. It is just a natural law that people have the right to live and exist, and nobody has the right to take the life of another person. Okay? So in non-cognitivism, we are not trying to motivate you by other reward or by punishment. No. You only have a sense of duty, which is the ontological theory, to do that which is right. And that is where these other two theories have their roots from. Okay. Are we fine? So that brings us to objectives of ethics. From all the discussions we've had, we'll just run through this because you should be able to grasp that by now. So the objectives of ethics is to define the greatest good of man and establish a standard for the same. So we want people to live good life, not in terms of money or material things, but you don't have to be harming people, hurting people here and there, all right? So ethics, that's the objective of ethics, for us to have the greatest good of man. Set, establish moral standards, norms of behavior. That is another one. And it's related to point one. The objective is also to study the overall be human behavior. All right. So we want to study the behavior of people, why people behave the way they behave, and so on and so forth. To apply judgment on human behavior based on these standards and norms. So once we've set the standard and we know your behavior, we can compare your behavior to the standard. And that will help us to judge whether you've do, done something right or wrong. Then we'll help to suggest, ethics will help to suggest moral behavior, prescribe recommendations about do's and don'ts. Then finally, one's opinion or attitude about human conduct is expressed in general, as far as ethics is concerned. So we can get to know how people get their opinions and their conduct, just as we've discussed so far in this lecture. Okay. So on this note, we are done with lecture one. Are there any questions? Thank you for your attention.
Are there any questions? Uh, 